Uh, my name is Sam Hirsch, and uh, uh, I'm an attorney here in town with Jenner and Block. And I was involved in the Crawford case dealing with the Indiana voter photo ID law. Um, uh, the biographies for all the panelists are in your materials. So rather than take uh, a lot of time with that, let me just say that to my left, uh, as we go, we'll just continue right down the uh, panel to my left, starting with, with Terry, going to John, Wendy, and then Rob, um, and uh, then have a bit of an open discussion followed by a Q&A from the audience. Uh, one thing we want to ask you to do is after this is over, please proceed directly to the lunch because the luncheon speaker, Senator Leahy, is on a very tight schedule. So we want to get that lunch going immediately after this session. Uh, the, uh, the genesis of this panel was, was the Crawford case, uh, which uh, uh, many of you will be familiar with, and it involved the constitutionality under the First and Fourteenth Amendments of the Indiana voter photo ID law. Uh, Indiana had had a split state government until the 2004 election, at which time Republicans took unified control of the legislature and governorship and proceeded to pass this statute. Uh, which dealt with um, uh, a very narrow form of fraud known as voter impersonation or in-person voter impersonation fraud, which is the idea of people showing up at a polling place, claiming to be some, uh, someone they are not, and then casting a ballot in that person's name, uh, presumably doing this multiple times in a single election. Um, Indiana had some history of problems with absentee voter fraud, <clears throat> but the uh, statute was focused on a very different problem, which is this in-person impersonation. Uh, what it required was that each voter, in order to cast his, his or her ballot, show an ID that was issued by the United States or Indiana with a photograph, with a name that conformed to the name on the registration rolls, and with an expiration date. Uh, generally, if you're a driver and you've been in the state for at least uh, a, s a short time, you'll have a driver's license that will qualify uh, under each of those requirements. Uh, but if you are not a driver, uh, there's uh, uh, a much greater chance that you would lack a photo ID that would meet all those requirements. And in particular, the people that are most likely to uh, be in that category would be people of low income who can't afford to have a car or keep up insurance or payments or pay for gas, uh, people who are elderly and, and can no longer, no, no longer want to drive, uh, people with certain physical disabilities. The statute was designed to some extent to deal with these issues, but in fairly limited ways. As to people with low income, uh, it provided that you could cast a provisional ballot and then take a second trip after Election Day within the next 10 days, go to the county seat and fill out an affidavit saying, I'm indigent. Uh, but for some reason, you couldn't fill that affidavit out actually at the polling place and get it all done in one swoop. So it required a whole extra and rather laborious step for people to take. Uh, the other thing that they did to deal with the uh, low income issue was to make state issued non driver's license photo IDs free. But to get one of those, you had to show what they called a primary document, which for most people would be a birth certificate or a passport. Passports cost about $100 these days, and, and birth certificates, depending on where you're born, can cost 5 to $12 or more, and in some cases can be difficult or impossible for individuals to get, depending on where and when they were born. As for the elderly, the, the uh, backup plan, if you can call it that, uh, in the statutory scheme was that uh, persons over 65, but not uh, generally persons under 65 in Indiana, have a right to vote um, by mail-in absentee vote, but of course that requires that you vote typically uh, uh, before the last day of the campaign, often before all the editorial endorsements come in, that you trust the absentee system to work and so on and so forth. So it's a, a decidedly uh, uh, second best form of voting for some folks. So this law was uh, uh, enacted in 2005 and immediately challenged by the Indiana Democratic Party and uh, by a group of uh, community organizations and a couple of elected officials in uh, two cases that got consolidated. They brought a facial challenge trying to invalidate the law as a whole for all possible applications. And uh, because no election actually been conducted yet under the statute, the amount of evidence that they could gather was somewhat limited. Um, there was pretty strong evidence in the record about the nature of the burdens that this law imposed on voters. There was uh, less strong evidence about the uh, 
uh, quantitative side of it, how many voters were uh, burdened in each of the particular ways that this uh, statute uh, created burdens. Um, with that evidentiary base, the, the case uh, uh, lost on uh, summary judgment, went up to the Seventh Circuit where it generated a split and very uh, uh, a heated uh, set of opinions, and then went in bank in the Seventh Circuit, it was denied in bank, but with, again, some very heated dissents, which attracted the attention of the Supreme Court, presumably, and they granted cert. And it was only at that point that, that uh, uh, my firm uh, became involved in the case. Um, others will talk here about the, the, the case and the legal implications of the case, but let me just very briefly sketch out how the court came down. Uh, it was a six to three case uh, with six justices voting to uphold the law, to affirm the opinions below. But they were split themselves three, three. So essentially you have three blocks of three justices each. Um, the uh, lead opinion was written by Justice Stevens and joined by the Chief Justice and uh, by Justice Kennedy. The uh, concurring opinion was Justice Scalia's joined by Justices Thomas and Alito, and there were two dissents, the lead one by Justice Souter joined by Ginsburg, and uh, also one by Breyer. So uh, that's, that's the alignment. The lead opinion uh, went through the three or four state interests that this statute supposedly upheld. One was uh, election modernization, and then very closely related to that was the interest in detecting and deterring voter fraud of this particular impersonation type that I described earlier. Um, and then they also pointed out that Indiana had a lot of uh, extra names on its voter rolls, which of course was the fault of Indiana's bad election management, but uh, that was a third point they made. And then a fourth point they made uh, was that the state had an interest wholly aside from actual voter fraud in voter confidence that the system is fraud free, uh, which is an, an interesting thing that I'd like to discuss later with this panel. Um, weighing against that was a very paltry body of evidence of actual voter impersonation fraud. And in fact, in Justice Stevens' opinion, he points to, um, to only two real examples. One is from the late 19th century Tammany Hall in New York City, uh, when apparently uh, they would take men with beards and then have them vote once, shave part of the beard, have them vote again, shave another part, vote again. But that was over a century old. And they, they found a single instance of a single voter in the Washington State gubernatorial election who they said committed this uh, once. Uh, that those were the only examples that they found, but yet they found that there was a, a uh, legitimate and deep concern that this kind of fraud was rampant. And in one of the great examples of, uh, I think, double counting, they said that this had gone on, uh, that there were reports, not, not confirmed, that this had gone on in Missouri and St. Louis. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Justice Scalia took a more sweeping uh, approach, uh, less fact-bound, and basically said this is a general law of general applicability. You shouldn't look at how it differentially impacts certain individuals or certain class, subclasses of individual voters. You should look at it as a whole, and as a whole, he found the burdens that it imposes on the right to vote to be what he's called minimal and justified. Uh, the dissent was, was the longest, dissent by Justice Souter was the longest opinion very detailed, very uh, uh, careful uh, going through the facts, not only the facts in the record, but a lot that he said he could take judicial notice of, um, gleaned from internet sites, interestingly, and all sorts of uh, studies that have been conducted in Indiana and around the country. And uh, then Justice Breyer, uh, uh, in a uh, roughly similar but much shorter opinion, also dissented. So that was the basic lay of the land. And what we want to do today is not so much rehash that case, um, but look forward and say, how does this impact voter ID discussions throughout the country in the future and discussions of other issues central to our voting system and our democracy? So uh, with that, I'd like to turn to, uh, to Terrence, who has a state legislative perspective, and uh, uh, then we'll move on down the panel from there. Thank you. I want to frame my comments by making them two brief, uh, using two brief quotes. First, um, H.L. Mencken once said, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And I suspect <laughs> that um, voter ID laws probably fall into this category. Secondly, John Stuart Mill once said that freedom and liberty are never more at risk than when the legislature is in session. <laughs> uh, that may equally apply, apply as well in this context.
Uh, we only have five minutes, so I'm just going to kind of run through. Actually, one more thing I want to say before I get into my five minutes. Actually, all those probably already started. You get six uh, now. <laughs> about the nature of legislative bodies, which will probably help each of us understand why voter ID laws have become the, the popular thing now among legislative bodies around the country, is that legislative bodies, by their very nature, are reactive bodies because each person who is a member of a legislative body has to stand for election at some point, either every two years or every four years, depending on what type of body you're in or what your state laws are. And because of that, that makes us very reactive. We respond to outside stimuli, even when that outside stimuli isn't necessarily the best stimuli that you should respond to. It's like that old maxim in the law that bad facts make bad law. Bad newspaper articles and bad French page stories make bad public policy. And that's probably the, the, the best context that we can put this in. So in my brief time that we have, I just want to frame this in you know, with four general points. One, that there are flawed policy arguments that underlie the push towards voter ID laws. Uh, it, secondly, the need for legislatures to respond to the myth that there's widespread fraud in elections in this state, in, their, in your particular state or in this country, which means that we have to overcome uh, the intuitive appeal of voter ID laws. Uh, secondly, uh, there are practical problems associated with acquiring the ID necessary to vote because there are groups of people who tend to have less access to identification. And then in light of Crawford, is there a, a progressive principled way to actually enact voter ID laws. And I throw that last one in, although I absolutely oppose the idea of my state having a voter ID law, but I throw it in because of that, my earlier point that there's a certain intuitive appeal and there's a certain pressure on legislatures as reactors and legislative bodies as reactive bodies to actually do something. And so I just want to start with the first point, this whole idea that we need voter ID laws because there's widespread voter fraud. Uh, there's been numerous studies that have shown that that's simply not true. Uh, when you read the Crawford decision, the Crawford court actually relies on the Carter Commission, which actually relies on anecdotal evidence that there's actually some type of voter fraud going on. And in fact, they've been unable to identify uh, anything beyond anecdotal evidence that, yeah, it has happened at some point in the future. Yes, the Daily Machine may have stuffed ballot boxes in Chicago, and Tammany Hall may have been involved in some type of fraudulent activity, but is it happening right now? Uh, I mean, in Colorado, I sat on the Secretary of State's Blue Ribbon Panel following the 2002 election uh, that met for over two years, and we looked for the, any evidence of voter fraud in Colorado's 2002 election cycle. We couldn't find any. Uh, there's a story out of Texas where the Attorney General in Texas went on a two-year voter fraud investigation and spent over two million dollars and he found 26 cases possibly of voter fraud and 18 out of those 26 cases involved mail-in ballots that were simply technical violations in terms of people showing up to help someone else fill out their um, mail-in ballot uh, because that person uh, was some was elderly or infirmed or handicapped. Although the most interesting case that he found was probably a, a woman who filled out her mother's um, mail-in ballot after her mother had died. Uh, I mean, that was probably the most significant um, evidence of voter fraud that was found. And so we actually, if we're going to do legislation on voter ID because it involves voter fraud, we actually should probably have some pieces of fraud that we can actually identify. Uh, <laughs> the second argument uh, that's been made is that we need to have voter ID laws to ensure that there's voter confidence and that people actually trust um, the election cycle. Uh, what I find interesting about this, this whole argument is that voter confidence uh, became a, a paramount issue, at least in political land, after uh, Bush v. Gore in 2000. And, and that involved hanging chads and whether or not every vote was counted. And it's funny how we go from uh, access to ballots and, and making sure that people can get to the ballot and utilize their right to vote to somehow voter ID, but yet we never address uh, the bigger issue of 
access to the ballot. We've immediately jumped to voter ID and voter confidence. Well, interestingly, there's actually been a study that I think is coming out in the Harvard Law Review soon, if it hasn't already, and, and it looks at uh, the last three election cycles, and it talks about voter, voter confidence, and it's found that uh, perceptions of voter impersonation do not correlate with the choice to vote or not to vote, and then voter confidence levels don't actually change based on whether there's more stringent voter ID laws in place. As a policymaker, I look at that and I have to wonder, are we looking for a solution for a problem that, has, that does not yet exist? And I have to say that that's probably what we're doing, uh, for better or for worse. Again, we go back to the idea that legislators are uh, reactive and that we like to respond to what we feel is the best thing to do. But a lot of times that gets us in a point where we actually end up making um, bad law. I want to switch to a different point since I know that I'm going to run out of town, time pretty quickly here and run to the idea of what are some of the problems associated with requiring an ID to vote. Well, the Center for American Progress um, has just done a study on the, on the ID divide, which is a cute little play on the digital divide. And it looked at several groups uh, that, are actually, that actually have problems with IDs or may not have IDs. And I want to uh, – we know the usual suspects, the young – those with suspended licenses, the elderly, um, those who use urban mass transit. I grew up in D.C., and I didn't have a driver's license for the longest time because I had access to the metro. Um, the red line was my friend. So there was no need for me um, to learn how to drive um, until at some point when I decided it was cool to have a car because girls like that. Um, but, was, but prior to that, I didn't really need a driver's license. But when you look at African Americans, and according to a 2006 Brennan Center study, 25% um, of the voting age citizens who are African American don't have a current government issued photo ID. That's compared to 8% of the voting age people who are actually in white. In Georgia, um, blacks are 83 more percent more likely than whites not to possess an ID. In Indiana, which is the subject of the Crawford case, 57% of blacks are more likely than whites not to have an ID. Um, similar numbers for the Hispanic community and for the Native American community. Those are some serious practical problems. If large portions of our population don't have IDs, don't have access to IDs, don't want an ID, especially in a society where an ID is not required, it then becomes a significant barrier, in my opinion, to access to the ballot box. And I know in Crawford, um, the lead opinion said that unlike poll taxes, voter IDs are not invidious, are, aren't, aren't wrong because they don't impact a basic qualification or they don't have anything to do with a basic qualification. I actually think that having an ID is not a basic qualification to actually vote. And so it should be considered a poll tax, in my opinion, when you live in a state and you live in a nation where access to an ID or requiring an ID is something, that's not, is something that we just don't do. So in light of Crawford and in light of the pressure that legislative bodies have to have a, a voter ID law, what should a voter ID law look like if we think there should be one? And I'll clarify again. I really don't think that we should have voter ID laws because, it, in my opinion, it goes against um, the fundamental basis of what our democracy is based on, expanding the franchise, uh, trusting that people do the right thing. But if we must, what should it look like? Uh, one, access to ID should be broad and, in my opinion, free. If you're going to require an ID, the, that ID should be free. Secondly, and I, I'm still in this idea from Professor Spencer Overton, if we're going to have voter IDs, we should also have election day registration so that you can actually show up at the polling place with your ID and register at the same time since we now know that voter, if you have a voter ID that you're supposedly secure, so therefore you should be able to register um, at the same time. Uh, we should also ensure, and I, and I think the Carter Commission at least had two recommendations, right, on their voter ID section. If we really are concerned about voter fraud, we should move quickly towards implementing, implementing the Carter-Baker Commission require, recommendations that, one, we have a top-down statewide database, and secondly, that we have interoperability among the states so that we can ensure that when one person moves from one state to another, that they're not duly registered in both states. In fact, I think those last two points, interoperability and a statewide voter database, 
actually are probably more important than implementing voter ID. Because after we implement those two recommendations, it's much easier to discover if there actually is wide-scale fraud that's occurring from people moving from place to place or multi voting multiple times during any particular election cycle. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, um, I think I'm about to move to Colorado. I'm very impressed with that presentation, and it, it's a useful legislative perspective. We um, would like to turn next to John, who uh, wears two hats here, both as at SEIU as someone who's involved in um, many organizing efforts, but also as a local election official and actually has to uh, make uh, election laws work on the ground for actual voters. I apologize. <coughs> I apologize, there's no bio in uh, the package for me, and I assure you it's simply for, because of my natural shyness, not <laughs> unwillingness to tell you who, who I am. But let, let me use that as an opportunity to tell you a little bit about SEIU. You know, SEIU's union, which I work for, it's a membership advocacy organization and a major force in American politics. Our members are people of color, low wage workers, public servants, and healthcare workers who have faced and continue to face challenges to their participation in the political process. Not only do our members support political candidates, they fight to, to ensure that their voices and the voices of people who look like them live in their communities and share similar work experiences are heard through the vote. And we are very concerned about restrictions and burdens placed on the right to vote, and particularly the, the voter ID law that was the subject of the litigation in Crawford. The questions left unresolved by Crawford raised two challenges in my view, for voting rights advocates and others uh, concerned about access to the ballot. The first is, can the voter, voter ID law be administered in a way which minimizes its burden on voters and mitigates the unforeseen adverse impacts on the voting process? And the exact mirror image of that second issue is, will the administration of these laws uh, help to define a class of eligible but unreasonably uh, burdened or disenfranchised voters who can serve as plaintiffs in an as-applied challenge. These challenges uh, are played out in a variety of, of contexts in the administration of, of the voting process. The first issue is getting uh, the ID. And I think the real subtext of Crawford and uh, something that I don't think was adequately acknowledged by the court is, is that it's really not an ID case in the sense that the issue is not proving your identity. Essentially, it's a, uh, a citizenship uh, uh, requirement that you have to be able to demonstrate your citizenship. And if you think about it, this is a, a uniquely un-American concept. Uh, Americans are not required to demonstrate to the state that they are citizens of the country. The only uh, a context in which that occurs is when you enter the country from the outside. So I think the correct image that uh, we should think about when we talk about voter ID is, is not going to rent a videotape, but standing in line at the Mexican border with a, 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 an INS agent saying, where are your papers? and in this case, the INS agent being the local election official. Now, on one side of the coin I, I, I described, uh, in terms of administering uh, voter ID uh, uh, laws, clearly the state has an obligation to educate vo uh, voters as to what is required. The state has an obligation to make available to uh, voters uh, uh, IDs or, or, or ways of getting IDs uh, uh, you know, in the communities in, in which they uh, live and work. But in this case, given the fact that it really is a, a, a Trojan horse for a citizenship requirement, the issue uh, in Indiana is getting a birth certificate. And uh, obviously birth certificates involve costs. They involve an additional um, uh, process the voter has to go through. And oddly enough, because of the concern about identity theft, states have become increasingly restrictive in terms of who they give birth certificates to. In fact, in South Carolina, for instance, you actually have to demonstrate, you have to satisfy an identification requirement before they'll give you a birth certificate that you use to identify yourself. 
in a sense, you have to produce a Indiana driver's license to the uh, <laughs> state of South Carolina in order to get a birth certificate, which you would use to get an Indiana driver's license. The other issue is uh, the alternatives uh, to the law. Um, absentee voting clearly is an important alternative, and it's mentioned by the court, uh, perhaps a bit dis dis dismissively by the dissent, but a absentee voting is an important way that people can participate in the election process. Unfortunately, in Indiana, the only people with the absolute right to request and cast an absentee ballot are people over 65. Indiana is one of these jurisdictions that requires an excuse uh, t to which the elector has to swear they're, they're, they, they qualify for in order to get an absentee ballot. They have to be out of the county. They have to uh, be working, scheduled to work for the full 12 hours the uh, uh, poll is open. They have to be infirm or a poll worker. And, and, and so, in, in a sense, while uh, absentee ballots are an important uh, uh, right for a certain segment of the citizens in Indiana, in its current form, they don't fully mitigate the, the, the damages caused by uh, this uh, restrictive uh, ID law. The next area is the actual administration of the polls. As Sam indicated, I, I'm actually a member of the Board of Elections uh, in a county in Maryland. And we spend a lot of time um, uh, training poll workers. And many of the complaints that uh, I deal with or hear about as a, as a voting rights advocate deal with uh, poll workers who do not know the law, who, uh, who administered either in an arbitrary or confused or unknowledgeable way. And very often, if you look at uh, uh, voter ID laws, they are incredibly complicated, both in terms of the kinds of IDs that are uh, uh, satisfy the requirement, the expiration date, does the name have to match, uh, how far can the name depart from the text of the name in the poll book, does it have to have any address, does the address have to match the address in the poll book, a whole variety of issues that uh, uh, assuming the best of intentions and, and not malicious intent, create confusion and ultimately disenfranchisement uh, uh, for voters at, at the polling place. So clearly, if, if, if a state is going to implement a, uh, a voter ID regime, they bear the additional burden of, of ensuring that not only do the voters know what's expected of them, but the poll workers are adequately trained to ensure that, that uh, the, the, the uh, requirements of the law are, are fairly and accurately administered at the polling place. Uh, the uh, other area uh, which I, is important is the whole provisional ballot uh, system. Uh, provisional ballots ha have had a somewhat checkered history uh, in the post-2000 uh, uh, voting rights uh, 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 story. Uh, while originally uh, recognized as an important safeguard for protecting rights of voters who were uh, questioned at a polling place. They have all too often become what's been referred to in some contexts as placebo ballots. You have the uh, uh, voter cast, uh, fill out their ballot, you put it in the envelope, and that ballot is never heard from again. Uh, in this context, uh, the, the Indiana law that does have two provisions for uh, for uh, provisional balloting. One for uh, an individual who uh, doesn't have uh, their uh, ID at the time they come to, to the polling place, and they can uh, cast a provisional ballot with the intent that it will be, uh, that, that they will come forward with the appropriate ID during the 10 day canvas period following the close of the polls. Problem there is that uh, the law seems to imply that they have to physically present themselves at uh, a, a, a circuit court or, or, or the election office, rather than simply having the uh, elector mail a photocopy or fax a photocopy of their ID to the election officials. And this is not unusual because essentially that's what HAVA requires for, for, for voters who register by mail and cast their first ballot uh, uh, by mail in an absentee uh, 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 manner. 
essentially what the voter has to do is they have to put a, a photocopy of their driver's license in the ballot return envelope for the election officials to see that they, in fact, have satisfied the requirements of HAVA for first-time voters who uh, register uh, by mail. And, and clearly, uh, the administration of the uh, voter ID law here would benefit from a similar procedure where it doesn't require two trips by the voter to, to the, um, to the uh, election office. The more egregious situation, however, is for the indigent. That here's an, an individual who does not have enough uh, uh, funds available to uh, purchase the documents to get, to get the free driver's license or, photo, or ID from the state of Indiana, who's now required either to take time off work to travel to the county seat and present themselves to sign a piece of paper which they could have signed when they were in the polling place in the first place. In fact, if you look at a provisional ballot application, it itself has an affidavit that you have to sign, that I am the voter, uh, I believe I'm eligible, I haven't voted uh, elsewhere, so help me God. That's uh, a, a classic uh, part of the provisional ballot application. Simply extending that or an adding an indigent uh, affidavit would cause absolutely no additional burden for the election process and would uh, mean that that indigent uh, elector would not have to uh, go through the additional time, burden, and expense of presenting themselves again before election officials. So while I think it's important for us to try to aggressively uh, protect the rights of voters in Indiana uh, uh, the best we can, I think ultimately the Indiana law is something that will and should be subject to an as-applied challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our, our next speaker is Wendy Weiser from the Brennan Center. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to broaden the discussion of Crawford a little bit um, to its impact on voting rights um, more broadly, um, focusing um, in, from, a, from a jurisprudential um, perspective. And, um, before I talk about um, voting rights more broadly, I did want to make clear, in case it hasn't already been made clear, that the, the Crawford Court didn't um, actually hold that um, voter ID laws in general or the Indiana voter ID law in particular are constitutional. It just refused to hold them unconstitutional on the basis of the record before it. And so I'll get back to that, but I, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't any misunderstanding with respect to that. Um, but from you know, um, the Brennan Center's perspective and, um, and more generally, the, the broader significance of the Crawford case is that it set the standard for assessing election, um, election laws and practices that burden the right to vote more generally. And Crawford is the first Supreme Court case in decades to address direct restrictions on voting. And by that I mean laws and practices that pr pr place direct barriers between citizens and the ballot box and that will completely disenfranchise at least some eligible citizens from voting. Yeah, and, um, and so that's, um, the, um, that's sort of the broader context. Um, and uh, to, to put it in, in historical context, the last Supreme Court case to actually address a um, direct restriction on voting was in 1974. And that was um, the end of a series of decisions that began in the mid-60s um, at a time when there was a heightened interest in, in voting rights issues. And since then, the courts on constitutional voting rights um, jurisprudence have, have focused on, on other areas, things like redistricting um, um, and, uh, and one person, one vote questions, and then um, and more um, uh, in, in a greater numbers on ballot access, restrictions on candidates' access to the ballot. So the, the focus in Crawford on direct restriction on voting signals a new generation of um, voting rights jurisprudence. Oh, am I not? Can you not hear me? Um, so, um, and... This um, new generation of voting rights jurisprudence comes in the midst of a new generation of um, restrictions on voting, and, and that's um, one of the things that the Brennan Center is working on. Um, over the past few years, we've seen a host of new restrictions on voting cropping up in bills and laws all across the country. Um, this has really stepped up in the aftermath of Bush v. Gore. And voter ID has been the most, uh, most common restriction we've seen across the country, but it's by no means the only one. And others include proof of citizenship requirements to register to vote, a range of other technical barriers to voter registration, one of which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, 
laws that effectively shut down voter registration drives like the league of women voters and one of our cases i'm sweeping purges of the voter rolls and restrictions on provisional ballots to name a few and each of these measures involves a barrier to voting and virtually all of them are impacted in some way by the crawford decision and so i'm going to talk a little bit about what the standard of review is in the crawford decision and how it affects these and what both what it decided and what it did not decide the court and in the lead opinion and at least six and probably nine of the justices held that the appropriate standard for assessing restrictions on voting is the balancing test set out in this case called anderson v celebrities which was a ballot access case and the court interpreted with the lead opinion interpreted that test as a sliding scale standard under which burdens on the right to vote must be justified by commensurate state interests so the greater the burden the greater the justification a state must show and this was one of several options that were available to the court and that were put forward to it by the parties um another option which is um the route that um justice scalia would have had the court to take was a a modification of that um ballot access standard um under which only those burdens found to be severe and it and he appeared to define those as those burdens that apply to the majority of people um would have to be justified um by the state and even handed in non-discriminatory burdens would essentially get a a free pass even if they disenfranchise individuals or particular groups of people and this was um the lead opinion and the did reject this on off approach and in fact six justices did um um and the um other standard that was available to the court that at least some groups of plaintiffs had um put forward was um a the standard that was used um back in the earlier era of voting rights cases um and articulated in a 1972 case called Dunn v Blumstein which was a fundamental rights approach saying that if you're going to put any restrictions on the fundamental right to vote you need to justify it under something that we now today call strict scrutiny um the court didn't take that approach um and it didn't address it at all um but it um it did address uh, another case from that era the uh, era the the poll tax case of Harper v Virginia Board of Elections and since the Harper case took a somewhat different approach and the court was advocating it it set aside a separate category of cases where um restrictions that are unrelated to voters um uh, eligibility are presumably subject to a more exacting kind of standard of review and and that was not the case um presumably in this case according to the court so while the court announced a balancing test in the Crawford case it in Crawford it didn't actually apply that balancing test to balance the state interests against the burdens it imposed on vo voters who don't have the required forms of ID and the reason why it didn't apply that balancing test test is that it found that the record evidence um was insufficient to determine the level of burden on those kinds of voters and that as a result there was no basis for claiming that the state's interests um in in the law were outweighed by those burdens and um th this actually was a, a a new wrinkle on the um balancing test because previously the the burden was um more um strongly in the state's camp and now there's a threshold inquiry that plaintiffs have to show they have to come forward with some kind of evidence of their burden before before the state has to justify the law um and uh, within it, um and not just um uh, they they we won't discuss um the quibble with the state whether or not it's accurate at this point that the evidentiary record was um was not adequate but the the court required a threshold evidentiary showing before the court will um really closely scrutinize a law and because the court didn't engage in this kind of balancing analysis in in that case it gave very little guidance as to how to apply this balancing test in future restrictions on voting rights um and and it punted this issue um and um leaving it to future cases and so um and we now have a range of other restrictions um that are ha have been bubbling up in the legislatures and um several of them are already in the courts and i, I want to talk about one that was recently argued last week um by one of my colleagues at the Brennan Center which i believe is the first um case um it's one of two pending ones uh, one of three pending ones at least um but it's the first argument um post Crawford as to um how how Crawford will be applied in a um uh, in a, to assess a, a restriction on voting and in that case there's an extensive evidentiary record of the burden the case um challenges a Florida law that prohibits election officials from registering voters unless the officials can electronically match certain information on their voter registration applications against other state records maintained by the motor vehicles agency or the department of social security 
And um, all states do engage in this kind of matching, um, but very few of them disenfranchise people, prohibit them from registering if they can't match, and there's a good reason for that. Um, the match process that states use is very unreliable. They typically have about a 20% match failure rate um, for, um, for voters who actually ought to have matched, um, who, whose information is actually in those other databases, but because of typos or other issues, um, the, the match process doesn't work. And, um, and in Florida in particular, where they actually were uh, attempting to clear up errors from the match rate, they still had 14,000 individuals who would have been completely disenfranchised in the 2006 election, and these individuals are in the record, um, if, there, if we had not won a preliminary injunction blocking um, application of that law beforehand. Um, that was under a statutory interpretation under two federal statutes. Um, on appeal, the 11th Circuit um, reversed the statutory in, um, interpretation and remanded to the lower court to consider the same case under our constitutional claims, and that's where Crawford comes in. Um, right now, this is a, a barrier that could disenfranchise even 2006, 14,000 voters. Um, in 2008, um, a year where there's a much, much, much greater voter registration activity, much more voters, and um, this is going to be the first time when the balancing test will actually be applied. There are some other voter ID cases and proof of citizenship cases that are also now moving forward um, on the Crawford analysis. Um, but the main doctrinal issue in this, what we call no match, no vote um, case, um, is really the main issue that was left unaddressed by Crawford, which is how do you deal with a law that is even-handed on its face but has a predictable and built-in consequence of disenfranchising a significant number of voters for reasons that are completely unrelated to their eligibility? And uh, if I put it another way, um, if an election law is generally not overburden overly burdensome as applied to the majority of people, but that will completely disenfranchise the specific and definable minority, um, how does the Crawford balancing test apply? And um, this, is, um, this is actually the issue in virtually all of this next generation of um, voting restrictions. And, uh, you know, from our perspective, the answer should be easy. The state should have to provide a sufficient justification for disenfranchising the specific categories of people who are caught up in a flawed system and not, um, as, say, Justice Scalia would have it, um, saying, well, if this works for most people, then the law ought to be upheld, even though it's unfair as applied to these people and they're going to lose their fundamental right. And this doesn't necessarily mean that a whole procedure in, in every case would have to be struck down. It could mean that uh, the state could provide a, an adequate fail-safe for voters that are caught up. But, um, but the, the standard should be that the state really needs to justify that by the same, with the same level of weight that it um, justifies um, the restrictions, any burden on voting. And, and you know, and a, a helpful analogy would be the due process context where um, in, in the um, due process jurisprudence, procedural due process jurisprudence, if you're going to deprive somebody of uh, their um, life, liberty, or property um, without um, you have a responsibility to provide them with some kind of remedy, either a pre-deprivation hearing or a post-deprivation remedy that is adequate. And, um, and, this, and this is regardless of whether, as applied to most people, the process used would be, um, would be fair and, and would, would not lead to a due process violation. But if in a particular instance this process would, um, would lead to an injustice, that itself has to have a remedy, uh, a, a remedy available to it. Um, and, you know, a, another related issue that's um, left unaddressed by Crawford is wh what do you do in the context when there are compound burdens? The court was looking at the um, voter ID law issue in Indiana in isolation. What's the state interest that this is um, purporting to serve? Um, you know, they, there were broad interests of in integrity of election identifying voters. But what happens if a state has 20 different barriers that are uh, attempting to address that exact same burden? And this is, for example, the case in Florida right now. There's a whole bunch of different restrictions, and we're, we've been involved in, um, in trying to uh, address many of them that are all supposedly aimed at uh, addressing the same kind of concern. Um, and so, it, you know, the, the no match, no vote case, for example, is purportedly one of the purposes is to ensure you're identi properly identifying the voters, but they also have a photo ID requirement, and they have a range of other restrictions that are designed to serve that same goal. And so the Crawford, um, so we don't know now, and Crawford doesn't answer how you, how you deal with that. Which of these, um, how do you challenge that? What is the adequate, um, the adequate alternative to serve the state's interest, assuming the state has a legitimate interest? Um, 
um, in, um, and, and what that means for the voters. And so I, I'll, I'll stop there and um, turn Thank it to you. Um, our, our final panelist is Rob Kellner, who is an attorney at the law firm of Covington and Burling here in D.C. Uh, with a specialization in election law. Rob. Thank you very much. Um, you know, before this session, there was a fellow who spent quite a while working on the stage back here, and I have checked a couple times to see if there's a trap door. <laughs> <laughs> the token conservative on the panel, Sam probably has the lever at the end of the table. Uh, it's also certainly the first time I've spoken at an event uh, sponsored by AFSCME, and probably the last time they will sponsor me <laughs> at an event. Um, I thought Wendy's um, point or suggestion that the Crawford decision did not actually uphold the uh, constitutionality of the Indiana law was an interesting one. And I, you know, as I think about it, I can think of a number of Supreme Court decisions that I would now like to strike down on the basis that they really just turned on the facts of the case. Um, for one thing, the McConnell decision upholding the McCain-Feingold law is now in jeopardy uh, as it turned on the facts of the case. And I can think of a number of others like that. So I'm not sure I find that argument to have particularly great force. Um, the interesting thing to me about the Crawford decision is uh, the fact that Justice Stevens authored it. The same Justice Stevens who authored the, uh, co-authored the lead opinion in the McConnell case, upholding the McCain-Feingold law. Um, and there are some really strong common themes um, between the court's jurisprudential approach in those two cases that I want to highlight. In McConnell, uh, Justice Stevens um, relied really purely on anecdote um, to uphold a statute against a constitutional challenge, against a First Amendment challenge, and eschewed really any requirement to rely upon empirical evidence, pushing aside some earlier case law in which the court had said that for First Amendment restrictions, you really have to have empirical evidence to establish that the harm exists. Um, the other notable thing in McConnell was an extraordinarily high level of deference to the legislature. And not just deference to a legislature, but in a case where there was a risk of self-dealing, where the legislature was essentially regulating itself or regulating the process by which it is elected or re-elected to office. And nonetheless, the court showed extraordinary deference to the legislature. And both those things are true in Crawford as well in the opinions that Justice Stevens wrote in both cases. And in Crawford, again, we've heard a number of references to the lack of you know, hard evidence in the case. And I really don't disagree with that. But to me, what's striking is the whole style of jurisprudence that it reflects, where there wasn't a requirement by the court that we have empirical evidence of a harm that the Indiana law was targeted against um, just as in McConnell, there was no such requirement. Um, and second, again, an extraordinarily lev level of deference to a legislature in enacting an election law uh, without really any concern for the fox guarding the hen house problem in constitutional law. So I think there's really um, a trend now in the way that the Supreme Court is adjudicating election law cases generally in many ways, I think, in Crawford, the reform community, the election or campaign finance reform community, is reaping the whirlwind that, that they created in the McConnell case. And I think it's going to come back to haunt really both sides of the aisle, so to speak, in different cases, as we're seeing um, in Crawford. Um, on the merits, I did not find the Crawford decision terribly surprising. The photo ID requirements in Indiana and in other states are really fairly modest restrictions, um, which is why when you look at polling data, without exception, huge majorities of the American public support photo identification at the polls. Huge proportions of the African American community, of the Hispanic community, of every other demographic group that's polled support photo identification at the polls. And I think that reflects uh, the common sense behind these restrictions. What I think is really behind the, the plaintiffs in the Crawford case, and we heard some of this, I think, in, in Terrence's remarks today, long term, is an attack on the voter registration system. 
because if you consider the really quite modest restrictions of photo identification at the polls to be a serious impediment to voting that's going to impact turnout differentially or otherwise, well, boy, you must really hate the voter registration laws because there is empirical evidence. There's a good bit of empirical evidence. The voter registration laws do significantly reduce turnout in this country. There's no question of that. There's really no dispute of that. We would have a lot more people voting if we didn't have voter registration laws. And yet we've had those laws for very many years. There's never been any serious constitutional challenge to them because they're an extraordinarily effective barrier to fraud. Um, if the plaintiffs had prevailed in Crawford, the logic would have led, I think, inevitably to undermining the entire voter registration system. Again, because in Crawford we're dealing with one kind of restriction, a modest one, I would say, and in voter registration laws we're dealing with nuclear restrictions. These are ones that really impact turnout, probably differentially, although I don't I'm not sure anybody's closely looked at that issue, but certainly in the aggregate. And I think we've heard some of that today. Now, Wendy makes the somewhat more sophisticated argument that what's really at issue here, in anticipation perhaps of my argument, that what's really at issue here is cumulative restrictions. That, well, you know, and she, I, she's not quite saying this, but I'll kind of fill in some blanks. You know, maybe. <laughs> Maybe the Crawford, maybe the uh, restrictions in the Indiana law, you know, or maybe maybe I, Wendy, wouldn't call them modest, but I'm sort of implicitly conceding that they're not quite as draconian as voter registration restrictions. But it's the 20th restriction that you're adding on, and it's kind of the straw that breaks the, the camel's back. To which I would say, if that's the case, you know, if it's, this is really just about cumulative restrictions, you know, then why don't we go after the big kahuna? Why don't we go after voter registration, which if you tweaked it slightly, for example, you know, instead of having to register 40 days before the election, you only have to register, you know, 15 days before the election. That's going to have a far more dramatic effect in increasing turnout, I suspect reducing whatever differential effects there are in the, vote, in the voter registration system and certainly increasing aggregate turnout. Now, if you were to go to same-day registration, that really is you know, the, the ultimate attack on voter registration. I, I don't think same-day registration has very much impact at all in preventing fraud. Um, I do think that's the underlying agenda here. Um, and, I, you know, I think as in many areas of the law where there's a reform, an organized reform community, just as in the campaign finance context, the long-term goal is really public financing of elections, that all these series of attacks on the campaign finance laws are really part of a longer agenda to achieve public financing, which many reformers will say in a private moment. I think here the long-term agenda is to undermine the voter reg registration system, and I think, I think the Supreme Court understood that, and it's one reason the Crawford case came out the way that it did. Let me just say briefly a word about what I think comes next. Again, I don't think it was surprising that this law in Indiana was upheld. I think others like it are very likely to be upheld as well. But the next real battleground is over citizenship. Um, it's over foreign national uh, voting uh, fraud. And, um, you know, Terrence, uh, or uh, perhaps it was John, spoke about, um, you know, it being sort of un-American to distinguish between, and again, it's, my words, paraphrase it, but sort of un-American to distinguish between citizens and, and non-citizens. Um, I mean, I think it's quite settled that the Supreme Court does draw distinctions between citizenship and non-citizenship. And certainly, if I can think of one context in which it should matter, voting is that context. Um, there also is research that's been done on this issue. And somewhat unlike the photo ID context, there's empirical evidence um, of foreign national voting in the United States. Um, it is a real problem that has been documented. And I think it's, it's the next frontier for conservatives who are seeking to increase election in integrity, reduce voter fraud. It's the next battleground. And if anything, because there is empirical evidence of the problem, I think it'll be a stronger um, argument than the argument that was made in uh, the Crawford case. I'll stop there. Thank you, Rob, for those, those uh, comments. Uh, um
Uh, we're going to have a, a little bit of a, a back and forth here, and then in a, about 10 minutes or so, we'd like to get some questions from the audience. But I have a question for the audience first. Um, if this was a big polling place, um, I just checked my driver's license, and it doesn't say anything about whether I'm a U.S. citizen or not, and nothing in my wallet does. How many of you are actually carrying proof of U.S. citizenship on you right now? I have my passport. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Let me ask Wendy a question. Uh, a lot of folks in the audience, um, whether they're carrying proof of citizenship or not, they're attorneys, they're law students, they are involved in this sort of litigation, and they're uh, trying to protect voting rights generally. If they come to you at the Brennan Center and say, my state or maybe my county has just passed a new law or rule that I think is unconstitutional or uh, in some other way illegal uh, that will restrict the franchise, I want to sue now. When, if ever, do you say, wait until we've had an election cycle and can bring to bear more evidence about the disenfranchising effects, the burdens on the voters? When do you say, go ahead, in the light of Car uh, Crawford? I mean, there, there are more than one reason um, to, to not sue right before an election cycle, in addition to that side of it. But it might be that uh, uh, as it gets closer to an election cycle, um, judges are... I'm sorry. As one gets closer to an election cycle, judges might be um, less inclined to want to change the rules of election, so it, it might not necessarily be the most strategic time always to bring litigation when you have other choices as to when to bring that lawsuit. Um, you know, it depends on the evidence that people are able to amass beforehand as to the impact. And so I think that there's, there, there will have to be you know, a lot more um, work before filing your lawsuit and amassing your, your evidence. And, so I, I, I don't know if I have a general rule, but uh, other than um, do, do a lot of research beforehand, conduct studies beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me follow up. Uh, Terrence had uh, uh, an interesting part of his presentation about if we decided we were going to have some kind of uh, voter ID law, what should it look like? Uh, that the ID should be free, the underlying documents should be free, that there should be a phase-in period, I believe. Um, that there should be an aggressive effort of public education to let people know they need these and to help them get them. And at the end of that, you said, but I'd rather actually not have it at all as, as a matter of sort of my, my state law. But my question actually is a question, let's we'll start with Terrence, but go down the panel, which is when in these issues are we better off letting the 50 laboratories of democracy work their magic, and when are we better off federalizing issues? Would we be better off, for example, to have a really progressive version of a voter ID law that was federal and preempted the bad ones, but also created a minimum requirement in states that currently don't have any such requirement. Now, this question gets to one of the places where I'm most conflicted. Uh, in one regard, I believe that there should be a national federalized top-down um, voter registration database, um, greater control over um, elections from a federal perspective. In a sense, we already do, because things like HAVA and the National Voter Registration Act all actually apply at the state level in federal elections. Generally, most state elections are queued to the federal election cycle, so federal law does apply. And so this myth that we actually don't have federal control over elections is simply that. It's a myth. Uh, most of our election laws are dictated at this point at the federal level. In terms of voter identification uh, at a state level, uh, it's been said, and the Carter Baker Commission frequently referenced the Real ID Act, and this is where I get somewhat schizophrenic. Uh, the, the libertarian in me is like, no Real ID, Real ID's bad. I, I'm in full accord with the Utah conservative Utah State Legislature that Real ID is absolutely bad uh, because it, 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 in some regards, it, I agree with some of my more um, paranoid colleagues in various legislatures around the country that it, it may be a step toward um, some type of police state. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but given what we've seen in this country since 9-11, 2001, it's quite possible. You, you just don't know. Uh, but if we are going to make this whole thing work, uh, there does need to be some more centralized control over the conduct of elections. The Elections Assistance Commission should probably have more teeth than what it actually does have um, at this moment. And at the same time, there are some clear examples at the state level where um, 
there are some progressive views of how uh, reform in campaign finance and reform in elections actually does work. Uh, but again, I'm going to go back to being schizophrenic. Our elections are so important that this may be one of those issues where the federal government should preempt. But as we've seen throughout history, preemption by the federal government is not always a good thing. And so maybe we just resort to broad guidelines as we have in HAVA, as we have in um, the National Voter Registration Act, and have those guidelines written in such a way that um, it's easy for states to implement. For instance, provisional ballots, and one of the big issues in the Crawford case was that provisional ballots weren't provided um, uniformly or adequately. Uh, if we're going to have voter ID laws, provisional balloting should be more accessible and should be given out when asked for. Um, as have a, as, a, as, as have a states, basically no person should leave a polling place without having cast a provisional ballot. I think that's one of those places where um, f federal government involvement has turned out to be a good thing to expand the fr franchise. I have some other responses, but I'm going to leave those until we get to another point because I don't want to really want to attack our voter registration system right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask others. Uh, the question of what about voter restrictions, if anything, would you want to federalize in order to preempt the worst state laws? <laughs> Anybody? Uh, no, I, Rob? Answer, yeah. uh, I would be reluctant to federalize it. I mean, Part of me thinks uh, it would be a good thing. My main concern is that it would be too easy to manipulate the entire election system. The advantage of having the 50 states doing what they do, even though they do it so poorly, is um, that very diversity makes it difficult really to manipulate the system. You might be able to screw up a couple of states, but you're not going to be able to throw the entire country. And I do think if you federalized it, um, there would be a real vulnerability <laughs> that um, well, you know, and you can joke about Florida, but the point is that you can't go in ahead of time and know where the problem's going to be. So you can't really strategically try to manipulate ahead of time. Whereas if you had a federal election system, you could, and if one party controlled Congress or another co party controlled Congress, they would be in a position to tweak that system in a way that would benefit that party regardless of the party. So, Rob, are you admitting that Diebold is a problem? <laughs> Not at all. Can I Please. respond to the question? Um, the strategic question as to whether or not you um, preemptively put in voting restrictions. I mean, we, we, we don't advocate voting restrictions on the federal mm -hmm. level or on, on the state level um, at all. But the, the question as to whether or not that would be effective in preempting state. Uh, th there already is a minimal national um, ID requirement in federal law and in the Help America Vote Act. And it, it's particularly ta um, targeted to a narrow category of voters, first-time voters who register by mail who haven't previously been in the system and otherwise been checked out. And that has not served as a deterrent for other states to enact more and more restrictive laws. So unless there is, unless the um, preempting law was one that also had a um, uh, had a requirement that no states can have a requirement that's stricter than that. It, it yeah, that was the uh, assumption in the question. Yeah, yeah. And the, so what it gives, obviously what exists in HAVA does not have preemptive effect. There was a brief filed by Amicus to that effect. The court did not even bother to respond to it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, in addition, um, that, that there's nothing that stops then Congress year after year, as has been going on in Congress, for trying to uh, adopt um, more and more restrictive requirements. And we've seen these. Um, bills, um, very, very, um, the, the most restrictive ones we've seen have actually been, um, was, was one that actually passed through the House of Representatives um, uh, in September 2006. So I, I think that uh, it wouldn't be the end of the story. Um. John. Well, when I was preparing for this, I, I tried to find uh, federal uh, IDs that might uh, satisfy the uh, uh, Indiana law, and there are actually very few of them which have photographs. But the, an interesting idea would be, okay, let's place a photograph on every Medicaid card, Medicare card, and benefit electronic benefit transfer card, which poor people have. Mm -hmm. And I think the legislators in, in Indiana would go crazy if the federal government had every welfare recipient in the country first in line at their polling places saying, it's a federal ID, it has my picture on it, I'm voting. That's, that's fascinating. Let, let me ask uh, for <laughs> members of the audience. Uh, we have a microphone up here. Uh, I think there's, um, is there just one in the room? 
Is that right? Uh, so please come on up and uh, uh, get in line. We can ask some questions on the floor. While we're waiting for that to happen, let me actually ask a question of you, John. Um, uh, we're looking potentially in November at a, what could be, maybe, a very high turnout election with a lot of new voters, a lot of new registrants. Um, what do you think are the stress points in our electoral system? And I'm asking you mainly here as a county election official. What do you think are the stress points that will tend to uh, uh, show problems in November if we have a huge uptick in turnout, including a lot of first-time voters? And what, if anything, can any of us do through lobbying our local or state officials at this late date or litigating even in the shadow of an oncoming election uh, to try to help that uh, work as smoothly as possible come November? Well, some of the challenges we face in, in uh, I'm from Montgomery County, Maryland, is uh, recruiting and training poll workers. Uh, we have 232 polling places and we have approximately 530,000 registered voters. Uh, and we usually have a pretty good uh, uh, turnout in elections, and we had a tremendous turnout, as you can imagine, uh, in the presidential primary uh, in uh, February. And it's training poll workers, recruiting them uh, uh, to man the polls. I also think a, a, another um, uh, a solution, which will be on the ballot in Maryland uh, uh, this coming election, is early voting and uh, centralized uh, voting centers. Uh, in addition to polling places on Election Day, to spread the burden of high turnout among uh, a, a smaller number of, of centralized voting locations prior to Election Day with uh, staff who, who, are, who are trained and may have more experience in operating system, uh, that will give uh, voters the opportunity to uh, stretch out the, the burden of, uh, of voting uh, over uh, a defined period rather than one day. Uh, I think in some places we may have already gotten to the point where it's going to be hard to implement the second of those uh, for this November. As for the first, one thing I want to, and this is a stolen idea, I didn't think it's up myself, but I think one thing we have to think very hard about is encouraging young people to serve as precinct poll workers, um, especially with the high-tech, relatively high-tech level of voting technology we have today as opposed to the old paper ballots. Um, it, people that are computer savvy and are comfortable with optical scan equipment, electronic voting, et cetera, are very valuable as poll workers. And I hope you all think about in your local communities how to encourage uh, even people who are too young to vote, high school kids, uh, college kids, and other folks that are comfortable with, with uh, these things to join with the folks that are already doing a huge public service by showing up every election day uh, with uh, a larger army of folks uh, from all generations helping in November. I think it will avoid some of these problems. Our first question from the floor. <laughs> Laboratory of incompetence. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> of course, it doesn't fit on the license plate. Yes. Um, my question, I guess, is principally directed uh, to Sam and when, actually anyone from the panel. But with respect to Crawford, um, I don't feel like anyone mentioned the elephant in the living room, uh, which was the elephant was an elephant. It was that this was a partisan. Uh, Act, which the, I think all parties sort of acknowledge that this was a legislature uh, driven to exclude a certain segment of the would-be voting population. And the Supreme Court essentially gave it its implicit uh, blessing, or the back of its hand. And I, I'm seeing shakes already, so this is a good provocative question, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, my question is, given the immense discretion afforded to secretaries of state and local election officials, which is really where the rubber meets the road in these election matters. To what extent do, you, do any of you think that the, the legacy of Crawford will not be so much about voter ID, and it won't be even about the, the Supreme Court, it will be about deference and permissiveness to those local officials in the actual administration of elections, not just limited to voter ID. To, to what extent might Crawford be the license to federal district courts and federal courts of appeals to say, we're not getting involved in this? Uh, that, that's a terrific question, and I'm not a panelist. So I don't want to take much time on this, but let me, let me just say the, um, the, the answer from the lead opinion in Crawford was partisanship's okay if it's one of multiple motivations. If it was the sole motivation, we'd have to get worried about it. But if, as long as there's some legitimate interest, we're not going to worry about the fact that it's heavily partisan. Uh, two, I want to raise this for, for, and I asked Rob to answer this uh, along with Richard's question, which is 
Scalia's opinion was predicated, which offered a very, very easy test to overcome uh, to uphold the statute, was predicated on the assumption that this is a non-discriminatory statute, that it's even-handed, that everyone has to show the ID, and that he won't look at the question of its differential impacts on the poor, the elderly, the disabled, and so forth. Um, but he didn't explain how he got to that conclusion. He says at one point that there's no express classification of voters in the statute itself on its face, tr basically true. But uh, he says that there's no intent to discriminate when there's actually tons of evidence that, that was exactly the intent of the legislature because they calculated this was going to be uh, of use to their party. It was passed on a perfect party line vote with zero Republican defectors on one side and zero, uh, zero Democratic defectors on the other. With, with that, let me pass on. Well, to I mean, first of all, that, that's why I, I disagree with the questioner's premise that there's no dispute that this was a partisan statute. I mean, it certainly is disputed, and the Scalia opinion reflects that. Um, you know, I've been privy to many, many Republican, you know, in-house discussions, private discussions about these laws, and it's really kind of amusing to me because I've never heard any reference to this is going to increase Republican votes or decrease Republican votes. What it reflects is a long-standing, decades-old um, belief within the Republican Party, and you can call it a paranoia if that's, if that's your choice, that there is systematic voter fraud um, in this country and that the voter fraud tends to slant against Republicans. And again, you can disagree with that, you can agree with that, but if the point here is intent, uh, there's a long, long record of that anxiety within the Republican Party. Um, and I, I absolutely dispute the notion that there was some sort of concerted effort here to skew elections one way or the other. I think there's no evidence of that whatsoever. And had there been any material evidence of that, I think you would have seen it in the Supreme Court opinion. You did not. Justice Stevens, who, as we all know, is a liberal member of the court, I think gave that no credence whatsoever. Um, and last point I would make is that the court itself, and I don't necessarily agree with this as a matter of jurisprudence, but the court itself in a number of areas has tended to not want to look behind statutes to examine intent. And that's one thing that we see going on in Crawford. Again, I don't necessarily agree with that approach, but it does happen to be very well settled law. Any responses from the other panelists? I just have a follow-up question, which is if, if um, there, I mean, there's a dispute as to whether or not there was intent, but if there was evidence of intent, if there was, you know, um, to discriminate um, or, or to have a differential impact based on um, uh, political party affiliation, um, how would that change your answer? I mean, my own view, not just in this context, but in other contexts, is that, you know, if you had a really compelling record, and I think it would have to be very compelling, that... Um, the legislature as a whole enacted a statute for an unconstitutional purpose, mm -hmm. that that's a factor that ought to be considered. I think it's relatively rare in the natural world to have <coughs> a compelling case of that. But that doesn't happen to be the way the law works currently. Yeah, this, uh, you're talking about partisan motivations. This little bit of information doesn't come from Indiana, but from last year's panel on this topic, there was reference to a Houston Chronicle article, which I have actually found was May 17 or May 18, depending on which edition you get, where they quoted a Texas Republican state chair or Republican official as saying that if you have a photo ID law, it will add a, an effective three percentage points to the Republican candidate's total. And then there's another famous quote from the Detroit newspaper, Detroit News and Detroit Free Press, of a Republican official saying, we quote, have to quote, suppress the Detroit vote in the 2004 election. And that's anecdotal evidence, which may be of some significance these days. I hadn't realized that. But it is, it is out there, maybe not in Indiana. And I might have that Republican folklore that you hear from these people. It's folklore. It's largely their excuse for the fact that they just don't win an election. And they, they have psychological problems dealing with that. <laughs> yes, my name is uh, Asa Gordon. I'm a... Uh, Executive Director of the Douglas Institute of Government, and I'm also Chair of something called the Green Party Electoral College Task Force. The, the Congressional Research Service has put out a report over the uh, suits that were filed over the 2000 election and arguments that was raised. And highlight the civil action that my organization filed over all of the suits that were filed. 
in that, uh, over that election. You probably never heard of it. Gordon versus Gore, Gordon versus Cheney. The arguments that it raised is that in, for the first time since Reconstruction, to apply the malapportionment penalty for the disfranchisement or denial of citizens' right to vote. One of my questions is, why is the legal profession particularly avoiding a constitutional provision that penalizes legislators for the denial of the citizen's right to vote? What is that about? The second thing is, why is not this subject, it's an essentially neutral practice that according to your statistic has disparate impact on a minority. Why is it not then voter ID subjected to the same scrutiny under the spirit that if you have a neutral practice that has a disparate impact under this 1965 Voting Rights Act, and why isn't it said to the Justice Department, you have to justify this the same way you would have to justify if you tried to redistrict your error and not show that it has a disparate impact. Why is that argument not being made that this, is, this has to be subjected to the same test, and which makes Skeeter argument ridiculous? Because the whole principle of jurisprudence in this era of civil rights is neutral practice that seems to be neutral on its face on everyone, but has a disparate impact. That makes Scalia's argument absolutely absurd. Thank you. Let's have some responses from the panel. Well, in fact, um, voter ID laws are supposed to be sent to the Justice Department for preclearance. Um, uh, the, uh, in, in certain jurisdictions, in Georgia, for example, um, the voter ID law that was passed was sent to the Justice Department for preclearance, and the staff actually recommended in a detailed memo that was um, released by the Washington Post that did not be pre-cleared because it had a, um, it would um, have a differential impact on African Americans and make them less likely to be able to elect candidates of their choice. That was overruled by the political staff, um, and so the law was pre-cleared at the time, but um, it does in covered jurisdictions have to go through pre-clearance by, um, under the Voting Rights Act. The second part of was the, uh, what is this avoidance? Look, winner take all disfranchises tens of thousands. You have states like Georgia. There is no winner take all statute. What in the heck is Georgia legislators doing disfranchising tens of thousands of people who vote Democratic on a winner take all basis where if those candidates came up and said, they, when you vote, you're not voting for the candidate, you're voting for presidential electors. Let's make that clear. Presidential electors, presidents, are actually figureheads for something called presidential electors. In the state of Georgia, there is no statute that the governor or the secretary of state can point to that says that the candidate that wins the popular vote in the state of Georgia is a call of all the presidential electors. So you attorneys, all you have to do is represent the percentage of those who voted for Democrat and say there is no state statute that says they can't vote in a percentage that they candidate want. Why are we not doing that? Thank you. Um, anyone want to comment on the Austral College? Well, I'll just make the point that in California last year, you know, there was in fact an initiative to make California something other than a winner-take-all electoral college state. Mm -hmm. It was actually a, generally viewed as a Republican initiative to do that because oh, in no more than the Indiana law. Yeah. <laughs> depending on the state <laughs> depending on the state, depending on your politics, it cuts one way or the other in no, California. You wouldn't do it across the nation. You wanted to keep it in California because it but, benefit the Republic. No, but I, do it across the country. Personally I think there is a certain logic to um, to doing away with winner takes all if you're willing to do it across the country. I think actually if you did it across the country, it probably benefits the Republicans more than the Democrats, but... No, it will not. Well, <laughs> then we agree. <laughs> I mean, there actually is a movement, this national popular vote movement uh, that's going across the country, and I know it's come through Colorado, and it, it was beat back in committee, um, this whole idea that the winner of national popular vote will get electoral college votes, and it's a response to um, Bush v. Gore. Um, but the larger question is whether the Electoral College is still necessary at this point um, in U.S. history. I would argue it's not. 
uh, you, know, you look at when we implement the Electoral College, not we because I'm not that old, but you look at when <laughs> the Electoral I mean, it's the regal we. Um, but you look at when the Electoral College was implemented, the whole idea was to protect the smaller states from the larger states. Is that still necessary? I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's probably not. There's pro there are other underlying reasons for they the Electoral College. The slave holding states from the non slave holding states, according to James Madison, who was at the convention and put that in his notes. Um, I'm, my name is John Weedy. I'm from Missouri, and as a state that successfully beat back its voter ID act, we're very proud of that these days. Um, and my question is, when you look at the politics of how these laws are enacted um, and how real ID is moving across the country as well, you're starting to see some repudiation of the Real ID Act out west mostly, specifically I think in Montana and Utah, as was mentioned. I mean, is that a momentum that's is that some momentum that's going to get built up, and there's, is there going to be a backlash on this, or are we just going to be stuck with it from now on after this decision? I think in the Western states you do see more of a pushback against uh, the Real ID Act, and part of it has to do with um, the natural the ideology that's fairly prevalent in Western states that we're a rugged individualist. I didn't even wear my cowboy boots. So I was going to wear them for that. Um, I'm a native Washingtonian, so it's against the rules for me to wear cowboy boots. Uh, but there is a pushback in Western states against the Real ID Act, and it does have to do with the fact that in states like Colorado and Nevada and Utah and Montana and South Dakota and North Dakota, Idaho, there's a strong libertarian strain in those states that resist any unnecessary and unwarranted intrusion of the federal government, in fact, of any government of any type um, in their day-to-day -day lives. So I think you will start, you'll, at least in the Mountain West states, you'll see um, more of a pushback against the real ID. Interestingly, um, I'm not sure if you'll see that same pushback on the eastern states because there's more of an acceptance of um, government intrusion of some sort um, in daily lives. Uh, I just don't know. We have about four minutes left. Uh, let me just ask if the two last questioners can each ask their questions, and then we'll see if anyone can respond uh, briefly, and then we'll all go to lunch. I do like getting the last word. Um, <laughs> I think he did. <laughs> uh, my question is about uh, litigation going forward. Uh, we know that after Indiana did vote, I mean, there were plenty of headlines about our friends, the nuns, who didn't get to vote in Indiana. But even more importantly, a lot of college students that have been disenfranchised. And tying into, I actually went to the panel that talked about the, uh, the ID divide. Uh, as well, and so just this idea that you know you get a driver's license because you want to drive a car. And when you go to college out of state, you're not required to get a new license to be able to drive in that state or to do other things. And it seems a little unfair to require a new license to be able to do something that has nothing to do with uh, driving to be able to then vote in that state. And I, I feel that there's there's a lot of room there for as applied challenges, especially in, in the post Crawford. Let's go ahead and get the last question in, then we'll have responses. Um, I'd like to go back to Representative Carroll's last point of before he had and take a little bit different spin on it. I'm from Texas, and a voter ID law in the next legislative session is pretty much a foregone conclusion. I'd like to hear the panel's view. I think we already have Rob's view that the next step from his perspective would be to do a citizenship requirement. If we give ballot security the primacy that I think Rob alone among this room might want us to give it, um, what other measures should we include, for instance, uh, absentee ballot security or other measures that, that would prevent fraud um, but not necessarily favor Republicans? So we have a question on carve-outs for out-of-state college students, and we have a question on um, uh, what else should go into a serious uh, attempt to deal with election fraud, if I'm getting it right. I could address the second one, um, and this is uh, the Brennan Center has um, done extensive work on um, voting system security, and in fact, in this room is the author of uh, our um, extensive reports um, on, uh, on uh, uh, the, called the machinery of democracy on how to move towards some um, voting system security. There's much, much greater danger to the integrity of our elections from 
tampering with or um, other problems with um, voting machines than there are from any in-person impersonation fraud um, that we've been uh, addressing today. And so that's sort of one major measure that um, we think that you know, states have been taking some steps in that direction. We think there's a lot more that they can be doing. And so we do um, commend um, our, um, our, our recommendations there. And uh, if I can take one moment to just make a, a pitch for people that are interested in these topics generally, we have a ton of information on our website, um, brennancenter.org, on, on the range, um, almost all of the issues we've been discussing today. And if you're interested in the Crawford case in particular, we have a page devoted to that. We also have a separate site called truthaboutfraud.org where you can um, you know, learn about the Houston Chronicle, but you can also get um, detailed analysis um, in, in, um, on uh, all the allegations of voter fraud and what kind mm. of in-person voter fraud there is in our country. The author of our extensive report is all on that topic is also in this room. And we also have um, a, a federal election reform .com in answering to what kinds of federal measures, wh which areas would be appropriate for federal intervention as opposed to areas that ought to be left for the states to experiment. Thanks. Um, you know, I personally would support reforming the absentee ballot balloting system. It's a little tougher uh, to see how to do it, but um, I'm entirely open to, to suggestions on how to, how to tighten up absentee ballot um, practices because it clearly is a vulnerability um, in the system. In terms of college students, you know, as, as applied challenges go, um, I'm not sure where the questioner went, that, that strikes me as not a bad candidate for, um, for a plaintiff for, for one of the first as-applied um, cases. I think you, know, you still have the problem that um, college students can get appropriate identification to vote, um, probably are less likely to go through the hassle of doing so, thinking back to my college days. Um, and probably, I think I probably missed voting a couple of times when I was in college, even before voter ID laws for, for similar reasons. But it does strike me as a good candidate for an as applied challenge. Thank you. John, do you have a quick, quick, quick Very quick. Comment. Just on, on the uh, voter ID laws, I, I think the best re legislative response to a voter ID law is election day registration. That, that, that they are linked because if you have a strong voter ID law, you, in fact, you have no reason to have pre-election voter registration because the, the whatever safeguards that was intended for to prohibit fraud is totally subsumed by the voter ID law and in fact it, uh, it makes it unnecessary uh, uh, for that purpose. And that will be a good topic for discussion around the lunch tables. Uh, Senator Leahy is coming. <laughs> Let's go.